I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Very happy today to be interviewing Ken Krimstein, author and illustrator of The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt, A Tyranny of Truth. A great graphic novel. If you haven't read it or picked it up, definitely you should. It's interesting, I was actually at a conference earlier this summer, and Homie Baba was saying that Hannah Arendt is now again a best-selling author, which is interesting, I think. In the last few years, there's been more of an interest in her thoughts and her work, especially on totalitarianism, even though it's horrible that people are worried about totalitarianism. For some reason, I feel sort of optimistic that there is a critical mass of people reading Hannah Arendt and others like her. Ken Krimstein is an amazing person to speak with, based just outside of Chicago. He has been in The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, Punch, McSweeney's Internet Tendency. Uh, you can find his work in a lot of places. This in particular is, of course, well illustrated and graphically really rich to look at, but also a fascinating biography of Hannah Arendt. So Ken, thank you for being on the show today and speaking with me. Let's talk about how this book was originally conceived. Did you always know that it would be a 200 some odd page, rich illustration of the life and works of Hannah Arendt and her time period? Or was this perhaps uh, something that grew into what it is today? My cartooning history mostly has been in the single panel form, like the New Yorker type cartoon where you see, you know, one image with a caption and something like that. I mean, that was always the thing that I wanted to pursue professionally. Uh, having said that, I always loved longer form comic books, cartoons, comics. You know, it's been a part of my life for so long. And I wanted to do a book, a uh, graphic novel history, taking a complicated subject and trying to express it in the graphic language. And luckily, I have a um, I have an agent and the agent said, oh, there's an editor in New York who likes your work and said, you can do it on anything that you want to do. And I said, really, anything, you know, I don't have to like try and do the son of the wimpy kid or anything like that. And uh, no, you know, anything you want. So I had pulled a few ideas together and I was interested, you know, I've been interested in philosophy and history for a long time. I was a history major and I, I, I emphasized a lot in philosophy. You know, in my reading, I had come across an essay by Leo Strauss, of all people, that kind of fascinated me called Jerusalem and Athens. And then I had read some other essays by other philosophers, um, some stuff by Walter Benjamin. And I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be interesting to find an essay, a complicated but interesting essay and try and do it in a graphic form so that it's understandable. Then I dug a little deeper and I thought, this is something that I teach and I'm really interested in is like, how does the life connect with the idea? I grew up in Chicago. You know, my grandparents were roughly the same age as both Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss and a lot of people. And I was thinking like, what was, you know, how does a philosopher through their quotidian day-to-day -day life think about ideas, you know, like a musician does or an artist or something like that? So I started just sketching pictures of Hyde Park as I imagined it in the early 60s when I used to occasionally visit. One thing led to another, and the publisher said, I love, I love what you're doing, but let's not do uh, Leo Strauss, somebody maybe a little bit more well-known or whatever. So I was looking for some other philosophers at the University of Chicago, and when I opened Arendt's biography, which I was always kind of interested in in a, in a sort of layman's way, it just it just captivated me. I mean, I felt like with every turning page, her story, her, her life story was so interesting. I had a top line and probably kind of misinformed understanding of some of her most famous uh, headline type ideas, such as the banality of evil, which I don't think I totally understood, but I kind of understood the origins of totalitarianism. And I had an image of her, you know, as a powerful expat type thinker who smoked a lot of cigarettes. And I, I was, you know, I had a top line knowledge, but as I dipped into it and I saw the deep connections with Weimar Germany and the filmmakers and everything that was happening there and the cafe culture and this great arc of a life, I was completely captivated. And so I started reading more and more of her work and criticism and things like that. 
when I came across the human condition, I found that so fascinating. And every time I would either turn a page in her life or in her thinking, it just was like sparks were coming off. So I put together a proposal, drew up a lot of pages, and boy, I was in business. They said, let's do it. And this was sort of late 2015 when this all kind of came together. I just immersed myself in it. There's several biographies. And, you know, as I say, I I really am not a philosopher. I don't look at this from a total philosophical point of view, but I feel that a fairly intelligent or anyone lay person should be able to grasp this material. So I plunged in. For instance, I looked at, I didn't even know about the Heidegger affair. I mean, I was aware of the fact that Heidegger was uh, very, very controversial in the academy. And, you know, I teach at DePaul in the College of Communication, and there are a lot of continental philosophers there. And I had read and seen things about that you know, in different publications, but I didn't know anything really about it. I knew about Eichmann in Jerusalem, but I made a point of not seeing any of the movies. I wanted to experience all of this. And as I say, the life was so interesting, the personality, and I wanted to connect the life and the thought and comics I found were just a great medium to do this. And one last thing, I know this is like the world's longest answer, but I've, I mean, I've done far too much thinking about this. As I opened the young, Elizabeth Young Broll had a uh, kind of like the standard biography called uh, For the Love of the World, I think it is. And, you know, there were some delicious little scenes in there, which I would subsequently come to realize that maybe Walter Benjamin would have called pearls, you know, or, or Hannah Arendt would have. And little vexing questions like, what was she doing for instance, with uh, graphology, you know, looking at handwriting to figure out personality. What, why was she interested in that? And why was Benjamin interested? So all these strands just kept coming together. And uh, I thought, wow, this is r- really, really great. And that was how I got into it. And boy, it was like, once I fell in, I just couldn't get out. I, I was, I loved it. And I still love it, even though I'm done with the book. No, that's great. That answers, starts to answer a lot of questions that I have. And I thought maybe we can go a little bit deeper into how you started to actually collect information and put that onto the page. I'm I'm curious about your process. So you list a lot of great work at the end of your book, stuff that helped you or inspired you and biographies, of course, of uh, Hannah Arendt. Were you reading simply everything you could get your hands on or were you collecting bits from different time periods at first. Could you say a little bit more about your sort of almost, I'm interested, especially in a daily process as you were working on this. Yeah. Well, that's a really great question. And yeah, the process. So on a daily basis, I'm like a miner. I'm like a, I'm like a drill. I'm drilling. I'm mining. I'm, I'm, I'm dousing. I'm, I'll look for the standard. I read the standard biography. What I do is I kind of keep one main notebook that I write everything in, you know, and I mean everything. If I listen to a podcast, there were some podcasts I liked listening to. Um, Melvin Bragg had a very interesting one uh, from In Our Time, and Lindsay Stonebridge and a couple of other people were talking about it, so I'd write about that. But then I would just walk through the stacks in the library, like at DePaul, and go to the section where they have all the books on Hannah Arendt and just pull them off the shelf and, and, and look at them. I love going through the stacks. And when I started the process, was very, very unformed. So some of the early books that I read that were my first impression, and I mentioned some of them in the end of the book, were very far out because Hannah Arendt's thinking is so creative. It inspires all kinds of creative responses, but I didn't know that they were kind of far out and they were very highly creative. A German woman had written one that just blew me away. So then I start getting more into the standard material. And all the while I'm taking a lot of notes and uh, if I purchase the book, then I write in the book like crazy. Uh, if it's a library book, I tend not to do that. Through the magic of, you know, as opposed to when I went to college and I had to do research papers using those little three by five note cards. Now, if I see something that I like, I just snap a picture of it with my phone, mm-hmm. compiling all this information. And I put it in a ma- kind of a master book that's rather unformed. I'll also keep note cards and the note cards that I write in fat Sharpie pen are bullet points of either emotion or scenes or episodes. So I'm kind of pulling episodes as I'm doing the research and questions that come up, wrestling 
with them. And there were big questions that came up. You know, there's some questions that were early questions that I'm still wrestling with. What did she, you know, what were her thoughts about identity? And they're not easy. And what I really wanted to do in in this one, Chris, was not start drawing too quickly, even though I had to do about 40 pages to get the publisher interested. Mm -hmm. And then they said, my God, did they throw me a curve? I mean, I tried to outline the whole thing and they said, yeah, we really like it. Now, can you draw the whole thing up? So that forced me to actually pencil the whole story. Now, when you say the whole story, you mean what what I'm looking at is 228 pages. Are you talking about they wanted all that? They did. They wanted to see the whole book. And I did it in, you know, pencil and it was fairly rough, but I had to, it forced me to really get the whole arc nailed down. My first intention, actually, what I wanted to do, you know, and these things change so much. I wanted to do um, like an encounter between Hannah Arendt and Irving Berlin on a, in a sealed train Orient Express car. I don't know why. I just thought two weird, strange <laughs> people of that time. That was just far too much. So I jettisoned the whole Irving Berlin thing. And then I realized I still needed a structure. And then I thought, well, I'm going to do the whole thing before the Eichmann affair. Because that's been done. I mean, there have been movies done about it and stuff like that. And her whole, the underneath the tip of the iceberg is so interesting mm-hmm. in her life. But eventually somebody said, well, you've got to, you can't not have that in there. That's such an important thing. So I, then I had to figure out how to work that in without dominating the whole story. You know, and as you sort of cathect with the subject of the biography, magical things happen. And So these escapes felt very, very like good tent poles. Mm -hmm. You know, there was the escape from um, the Gestapo in 33. Then there was the escape from Vichy, France around 1940. And then I knew there had to be a third escape because I, you know, I reread Aristotle's poetics um, (laughs) in, in the translation from a couple of professors of mine at Grinnell. And it was fabulous. You know, I thought, well, if I'm going to tackle this, I might as well start with the master of, of them all. And I realized that you need three acts, but I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be. But I knew there had to be one. So I was feeling it out. And then by doing the pencil, which was, yeah, I mean, 240 some pages, I got the flow, you know, of the book. I nailed it down. But I wanted to also track the development of the thinking. You know, I'm a musician. In addition to being an artist, I'm, I'm a musician and a music fan. I love reading biographies. Often when I read about artists or musicians, I try and figure out, you know, what was it in Willem de Kooning's life that made him paint like this? Or, you know, what was it about Liverpool in the 1950s that made the Beatles music, you know, and how did Hamburg fit into that? So I wanted to find out how the life would affect the development of what I would call the art or the thinking. Mm -hmm. That was where I was looking. So that strand had to be developed too. And I had to, do it in such a way that there were dramatic arcs so that you wouldn't get bored. So it was a lot to juggle, but I I parsed it as I was starting to then, once I had all the ideas and I knew what the big ideas were that I was trying to deal with, it was was really quite challenging for me. I mean, um, yeah, I've taken some philosophy classes, but by no means am I an expert in phenomenology. So I had to like start learning up on that as much as I could to grasp it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had taken some classes in existentialism, but I didn't really understand the connection between existentialism and phenomenology. And as I've said, you know, when I lived in New York City, you know, I used to go down to the St. Mark's bookstore and I pick up a book by Walter Benjamin. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. You know, and then I realized that Benjamin is like this great friend of Hannah mm-hmm. Arendt. And I'm like, wow, what's the connection between their thinking? So I was going down these paths and then I'd have to always make sure I would pull myself back to the the Hannah Arendt developing story. And it's this kind of contraction and expansion and contraction and expansion that goes on for, you know, even after I finished the pencil, I had to tighten some of the thinking, you know, right up to the end. Hmm. So that's how it kind of worked. And I mean, there's a lot of interesting things about decisions you made. I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, kind of small concrete ones. Like, for example, the book, for anyone who hasn't picked it up yet, is pretty much black and white. But Hannah is always in green. Yep. I'm wondering if that was a, yep. a specific choice. What made you do that? Yes. Well, that was a specific choice. When I was making the book, luckily, I had a connection to Jerome Cohn, who's sort of the executor of the Hannah Arendt, a trustee of, of her estate and was a student of hers and really a great scholar and a nice guy. I spoke to him and I tried to get a sense of Hannah's 
Hannah Wren, I call her Hannah because I feel mm. I know her so well, her, her character. Along the way, a little thing came up, not from him, but I think I read it somewhere. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm just wool gathering. Jerome Cohn talks about a lot with Hannah is contingency. Pretty much the way I interpret it as a lay person is sort of what life throws at you. It's just things that happen to you. So this decision of Green was a combination of contingency and then creative response to it. So the publisher, it's expensive to make a four color book, uh, a full color mm-hmm. book, four color, whatever, five color. They said, um, you can have one color. <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess that's better than none, you know. And the question was, what would that color be? You know, again, in that wool gathering, I remember reading that Hannah Rend, in early in her life was known to wear green a lot. In fact, at one point, they referred to her as the woman in green. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And then, you know, as I was studying about her, this notion of natality or birth or newness is a very big part of her thinking. And I thought, well, green, green works for that. Hmm. I thought, oh, I'll do that. And then the other thing is, the other challenge that I faced uh, in drawing is she has to age, you know, mm-hmm. and I love Charlie Brown and Charles Schultz and it's absolutely genius. And But I say, you know, the only thing that he might have had that I didn't have to deal with is Charlie Brown never aged. He was always the same age. And I had to figure out how to make Hannah look the same but grow. And I thought by always identifying her with the green would help the reader, but it also helped the story. So it, again, it was a back and forth. And then after I had done the book, fellow artists came up to me and said, oh my God, what, are, were you crazy? Why were you working with green? <laughs> green is so hard. I'm like, is it? And they're like, yeah, why? And they're like, because it's not red and it's not blue. <laughs> That's an artist's answer, yeah. you know. And but it is tricky. But since I have so much experience working in black and white and gray, I saw it more as a tone than a hue. And then finally, you know, these things just happen. And someone said to me after a a talk that I gave, you know, green is the color of natality in plants, but in flesh, it's the color of mortality. And I thought, wow, that that kind of works, too. Mm -hmm. So. It was a decision, and it seemed to be the right decision. So I'm pleased about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and it definitely. I mean, it works, and on a, I mean, conscious level, as I look at it and I think through it, I think it, it works as you've said. But unconsciously, just kind of the feel of it seems intuitive for a reader to follow through like that. You also chose in the narration to use first person. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Whether that was always just obvious to you, or whether you went back and forth, maybe, in a th- sort of third-person, first-person question. How did you come to decide that you would speak as uh, Hannah, in a sense? Yeah. Okay, so, again, it's all a process. I mean, my initial intent was to have no narration at all, and just what she says on the page. Mm-hmm. There are some graphic novels and comics that do that, and do it quite wonderfully. Mine was not going to be able to do that. There needed to be too much interior thought. So then I tried doing it as third person, and that caused a couple of other problems. Like, who is this person? Mm -hmm. Me? No, that's too heavy. I don't want it to be me. But I want to have a voice. And then I thought, well, let me try it first person. But then I thought, I want this to be like a performance You know, that's one of the things that I kind of learned from the Aristotle stuff is that drama or plays or performance, even though you don't have the, well, I guess in in Greek tragedy, they did have a chorus that commented, but in any case, it should take place. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting if I could have a first person narration that tracked her level of intellectual development kind of Mm -hmm. along the way, just to immerse yourself in her as she grows. So that sort of seemed to kind of work. And then what happened was I decided I wanted to do tons and tons of footnotes for a couple of reasons. I wanted it to have like, I wanted this to have a very, I don't mean this in a bad way, but a prolix, a lot of words, um, Talmudic kind of Mm -hmm. feel. And I thought people don't know who a lot of these historical characters are. So I'll comment on them in sort of David Foster Wallacey type footnotes. And then I found that that was where I could have my voice. So that was where my voice really came out. And then with the Hannah Arendt uh, narration, I also made a choice, or maybe it was intuitive. I was going to have her speak in kind of our vernacular, not in the vernacular of her time, even though she, I wouldn't have her saying anything that didn't happen in the time. 
but I didn't want sort of archaic forms of speech that maybe from another era to make a barrier between engaging with her as a person. I was very, very interested in doing that. So I tried to have her speak in more of a current parlance. That's kind of how it worked. Another thing I will add is that my handwriting actually is kind of a tonal thing too, which happens in in comics. Mm -hmm. That was another part. But yeah, I liked having her speak as the narrator because, and I guess now I'm just thinking of this, I mean, from what I've read about a lot of her thinking, she feels that her way of having this kind of active thinking through is when you have an engaged dialogue with yourself. So maybe that kind of helped to show that she was always having this engaged dialogue. I'm not sure. I think that's probably one of the hardest things I can imagine in doing this kind of work is that she's constantly thinking, like most philosophers, which is not very easy to demonstrate or to represent. And so I'm I'm wondering if you had any other challenges in representing philosophy and philosophical thoughts, because I think it would be easy to have only talking head dialogues, but that's not how the comic looks. I mean, you do have dialogues or people talking to each other, but you represent thinking and philosophy in different ways. Were there any other challenges other than the, the narrative part? Yeah. When you do a comic or a graphic novel, you have this incredible tool chest of visual tricks and tools and devices. Um, I can make a diagram. I can do repetition. I can invert things. And as long as the reader can follow along, it can help. I also teach and I worked for a long time in advertising. So there were some instances where I reached into that toolkit to show how abstract ideas might, might develop. Like, for instance, there's a scene later in the book where she's trying to get herself out of a tough problem. And she kind of, you know, sees the image of Walter Benjamin as a water stain on the Mm -hmm. ceiling in her apartment. And they have a dialogue with each other. This is a way of me showing that she's wrestling with some of the thoughts that Benjamin had, maybe she had picked up from him about how you can't be alone in the world when there are other people. It causes challenges to your thinking and communication. So I could have Benjamin and her have this thing. And then Benjamin starts projecting images of of Adam and Eve in the garden and Adam and Eve with other people on the ceiling, which are visual descriptions. And, you know, even from the very, very earliest impulse where I wanted to try and take what I would call complex philosophical ideas, I love diagramming things. I mean, that's the way I understand the world. I mean, I can't, I sort of can't talk to people without a pencil and paper in front of me. So I use this a little bit, you know, in the book, but then there were also instances where, Some of the confrontations, ghostly people can walk out of the back and they can distort. Time can be shown passing. There's one scene where she's pondering something and it's the same exact shot of her, except her cigarette gets shorter and shorter. So you can sort of Mm -hmm. see the passage of time. Yeah, I mean, there's a challenge in every in every frame, but I tend to look at it hopefully more as an opportunity to um, communicate a feeling or a thought. Yeah, I think we could talk all day about how great comics can be in that sense uh, of visually representing things that other media simply cannot allow or or allow in different ways that may or may not be as effective. But I want to ask then about a more specific choice, I guess, in representation, which is, yeah, as you started to mention earlier, the the affair she had with Heidegger. I can imagine, and I I have to say I'm not an expert in this, I don't know, I, I know probably what the average academic might know, but I haven't read deeply about this subject. But I mean, that's a, a somewhat private thing, or it's a very private thing, but n- there's not a lot of, I think, as far as I know, conclusive evidence of exactly what they did, what they said to each other, other than perhaps correspondence or whatever's available. So how did you make choices, for example, like in the bedroom, which we don't have, yeah. we don't have access to as historians or as philosophers? But you're still talking about that. You're still going to represent it. So how did you make those kind of choices? Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, I looked at a lot of the correspondence and it certainly it showed a lot of ardor. uh, I'm thinking, you know, I had read quite a bit of some of the other histories. And there are a lot of people who uh, who feel that they definitely did have, you know, a physical Mm -hmm. affair. You know, in a way, that's kind of why I, I guess, you know, the whole Weimar period the whole 20s, the Roaring 20s, I was kind of very interested in feeling out the kind of, no pun intended, the uh, the level of sensuality or sex 
sexuality that was happening. And this led me uh, to figure out when was the condom invented? And you'll note that I have a scene mm-hmm. in there. And, you know, it kind of it kind of works in, and, you know, what was happening in culture? You know, and then I thought, well, OK, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, you know, a lot of people say they had an affair. All right. And it was probably a physical affair. And in fact, although a, a large part of Heidegger's correspondence hasn't surfaced, a, a lot of some of it has and a lot of Hannah Rents has. So, you know, they're talking about longing and running. He's he references running his hands through his her hair and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So then I thought, OK, it wouldn't be right to not show it because I'm trying to do the human the human part of it. Now, there's the question of the fact that Hannah Arendt, as a person, made a huge separation between the private life and the public mm-hmm. life. Yes, absolutely. So I had to think about this. And if you note, even in, in the beginning of the book, I kind of make a little caveat. This is a story about a person named Hannah Arendt. I mean, Hannah Arendt, God love her. I wish she were around, you know, as as Jewish people say, Oliver Sholem, she's not here anymore. Oh, I wish she was here. This is a story about her, a character, not her. So I thought, you know, I have to be true to how I feel the story has to be told. You know, there's no real, as you say, there's no conclusive evidence that says it did or it didn't happen. So I chose to think it probably did happen. And it opened up a lot of possibilities for me. And I had to do it in a way that wasn't salacious, Mm -hmm. but I had to do it in a way that showed that, and Hannah Arendt has said in her correspondence, you know, much of the, the thrill of the relationship was in the, you know, in the language and the thinking. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, and then I, I had to study up on, on Heidegger and his magnetic appeal and not just to, you know, Hannah Arendt, but to all these other very, very important and prestigious philosophers, many of whom were Jewish. And the, he definitely had some sort of an incredible charisma, although I've read some stories from some people who say he was very weaselly looking. He did do some extraordinary things. You know, he was kind of a, you know, he skied to class. He built his own cabin. I mean, he definitely had a sense of uh, being an extraordinary character. And even Levinas said he brought thinking alive. So I saw him as a very charismatic character, and I felt that I didn't want to shy from it because it's a part of her life. But I didn't want it to be salacious. So. Yeah, and I mean to just further that a little bit. I mean, as far as I know, it's not really controversial to assume that they had a physical relationship. But it's very difficult to imagine or to know, I mean, maybe impossible to know, if Heidegger was sort of a predator in this, and that she felt uh, like she was a victim, or if she maybe kind of seduced him or something like. The sort of internal tensions or thoughts is especially what we don't have access to. In a similar way, I understand that they found evidence of uh, Heidegger writing things or condemning certain people during the Nazi rule. But then some people say that he did that out of, you know, sort of trying to protect them in a way that he could or something. And then other people yeah. think that, no, no, he was just a horrible person. How did you sort of negotiate that as you were working on it? Because you might find a document that says, Heidegger became a member of the Nazi party, or he endorsed this member of the Nazi party, or something like that, which is not very controversial in the sense that we have records. But why did he do it? What was his motivation? Was he really a bad person uh, completely? Or was he trying to help Jews by, I don't know, doing doing something instead of somebody yeah. worse than him, perhaps? Yeah. How did you negotiate that kind of history? Yeah. So I'm creating a story based on what I put together from things that these people did to get a sense of his character. I I don't really know what his real deep motivation was. And I tried to not use a lot of stuff, you know, like these black notebooks and things like this that came out afterward. But even from evidence of things that I had read, as I kept working on it, you know, and there's no conclusive answer, but I had to make Heidegger also in this a character and I make my own assumptions. So, you know, he was a serial womanizer, not just her. His wife enabled it in a way, but he had a lot of charisma and he was a very smart person. If you read the book, you can kind of see he's kind of the bad guy. Mm. I mean, he's kind of, even in terms of shorthanding the philosophy, which I had to kind of do, and it's not, probably would not get me an A at Cambridge University, but, you know, maybe it's sort of right. From what I can understand, a lot of his philosophy was very much sort of unto death, which is kind of right. And then 
I, I felt that Hannah Arendt, in a way, was about, you know, using sort of, to use an old-fashioned term, the distaff, the female side, about birth and natality. So I was just to kind of have attention. But then there's the fact that they correspond and they see each other throughout their lives. And there's the question of, did she disavow him enough? Did he disavow himself enough? Who apologized to whom? And I make some assumptions, because that's obviously, to me, a huge dramatic Mm -hmm. question in the book. And I make some assumptions about how I feel, based on the fact that she writes this essay, Heidegger the Fox, which is pretty well known, and it certainly seems like she's taking him to task. She was going to dedicate the human condition to him, but he didn't even acknowledge the origins of totalitarianism and stuff like that. So she writes to him basically and says, I was going to dedicate this to you, but I'm not going to. I mean, there's definitely a sense that, so I'm trying to put the human point in it. And then you're dealing with a mind like Hannah Arendt, who is like this incredible, loves to take the pariah outsider point of view, but also loves to face reality. I don't want to kind of, you know, what I think about it, hopefully the reader can bring their own interpretation to it. My assumption is, is that she honored the intellectual debt and maybe in an emotional way, to use an old fashioned term, carry the torch for him for a little while. But I think she basically was mature enough and with Carl Jaspers and other people to really separate herself from him. And, and, and in a way, I think kind of loathe him in a particular way. That was just an emotional thing that I built into it, but I didn't put anything in there that wasn't part of the historical record, except a fantasy scene where she has to come to grips with Mm -hmm. his legacy. Yeah, it's very, very tricky, and I don't presume to be able to dig deep into, from what I've read about him, he seems like he was a pretty horrible guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he he seems like, you know, a lot of people are horrible. Was he as bad of an anti-Semite as his wife? No, I don't think so. But was he a Nazi? Yeah. Was Ezra Pound? Yeah. Was Raul Dahl? Yeah. This is not apology. I mean, did Hannah ever make any great apologies for him? I don't know. She helped him get published. So you can see in the book, I make that like a turning point because I think I think she disavowed him emotionally, if not intellectually, hmm. I think. But I could be wrong. And again, you know, I'm not making it cut and dry because it's a drama. I mean, the history, it's a kind of historical drama. Yeah, that that makes sense, yeah. I'm speaking about this more than I typically would would like to, because this is really, my business was really just to try and look at what happened and see how my interpretation of Hannah Arendt's character dealt with it. Because one thing that I tried to put in the book, but I couldn't as much as I would have liked to, was the incredible uh, relationship she had with her second husband, Heinrich Blucher, who everything that I've read from Blucher, the guy is like, so freaking off the charts. He's sort of an autodidact genius hmm. um, in many ways. And I think, you know, Hannah Arendt was a sponge for information. And they evidently, you know, they called their marriage the dual monarchy. And people still in New York still talk about what an incredible relationship that was. So I didn't really have time to put that in as much as I would have liked to. But yeah, it's a very, very difficult subject. And I don't want to divulge too much what my own feeling about it is. One of the quotes that Hannah Arendt said that I kept over my desk as I was writing is storytelling can reveal meaning without committing the error of defining it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully there is meaning in this story, but I can't totally define it. So that was what I was trying to do. Yeah, no, that's funny. That's a great quote that I actually bring up in some of my classes from her. And I mean, I'm not someone who has studied her intensely. I'm not by far not an expert uh, in her her work. But the book definitely rekindled a lot of that, and I want to go back to some of it, as I'm sure it would for anyone reading this. So, oh, great. It's a great sort of, well, it's a, some extent a, a historical narrative, a biography, but also sort of a passionate take on a lot of the 20th century philosophers that we think about today. Well, how did you think about, because you mentioned how you, you used a mo- sort of modern dialect that she might not have used at the time, but that would resonate with readers today. When you were looking at these philosophers and these people and this story, how much, if at all, were you thinking about today's political situation, today's issues, and trying to reflect that? Because I know uh, at least one thing that stood out to me was, I think it's when they're starting to talk about the Holocaust and somebody calls it fake news. That, I mean, obviously that resonates with today, but I'm curious how much you were thinking about today while you were thinking also about these 1900s, 20th century philosophers. Well, yeah, thinking about today, 
all the time. But today, when I was writing it, like I started writing it in 2015, when uh, the current political moment hadn't fully formed, but it was certainly brewing. But yeah, I mean, you know, in a way you could you could say, oh, my God, it's it, it, uh, it's so terrible that the same kind of horrible stuff, you know, uh, that was going on in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, hmm. you know, is still happening today. And that's sort of part of, I think, what she tries to wrestle with is why, you know, why do people make other people stateless? Why do people strip people of their humanity? Why do people commit violence on each other? You know, I mean, she, she asked these political questions. And, you know, another thing that spurred me into this was why does someone who arguably, I mean, you know, I, again, could have been like one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. Basically, she ex she excuses herself from the practice of philosophy and becomes like political ac action type person or a new sui generis type thing. But I did want it to feel very, very current. And as the political moment took form, the resonances of the things that were happening, not only when, you know, the evidence of the Holocaust came out, uh, but even in the Café Romanich in the early 30s, where people were making fun of that that Austrian paper hanger with the with the weird haircut, mm -hmm. you know, and and Hannah Arendt was was so vehemently opposed to these you know, the chattering classes. And that struck me because, you know, what do we do? We chatter. You know, I do. Others do. We and I guess, yeah, the resonance is I was always trying to connect it to not only the current moment, but me as a person, like, what would I do in these situations? Like I was saying the other day, and I was working on a piece, like, what if the police, you know, and I'm, you know, I own a house, and I have kids, and I try and obey the laws and whatnot. And what if the police said, okay, you might want to leave Evanston, you might think bad things are happening, but trust us, everything's good. And I knew that like bad things were going to happen. But the police are saying, stay, like, would I leave? Hmm. Really, I had to ask myself, would I do that she did it was kind of like i'm always trying to bring it back to the current moment and there were there were other times in there that i could relate like that moment when she leaves when she kind of basically walks out of the girls detention camp mm -hmm. when there's that fog of war well i was in new york city during 9 11 i remember i had just dropped my my son off his first day in kindergarten and my wife called and said a plane hit the world trade center and i thought oh a stupid little piper cub blah blah mm -hmm. blah and I was walking around and nobody knew what was going on, even though we had cell phones and stuff. And I'm like, that's what it must be like. So I'm trying to make it immediate. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, the political situation, yeah, I'm wrestling with it, you know, constantly. And she tackled it. You know, I did do a lot of reading about Plato. And I realized that, you know, everybody talks. And I took some great courses in Plato's Republic and things like that. And yes. Everyone says Plato's Republic, great. Well, yeah, it is great. There's a lot of great thinking in it, but there's a lot in it, which is, how can you implement mm -hmm. it? It's ridiculous. So I liked following her thinking to these kind of heights. And it's funny, I just saw these resonances, big John Lennon fan. And, you know, I know this sounds almost like trite, but imagine is almost a, a version of like a Hannah Arendtian kind of vision of the world, you know? And uh, in a in a kind of non-linear, you know, maybe doing disservice to both of them for me to make that connection. But I put a little uh, epigram in the book from Bob Dylan because uh, he had just gotten the Nobel Prize and, and it was in the, my mind. And, you know, it comes from the subterranean mm -hmm. homesick blues. And he says, um, don't follow leaders watch and watch your parking meters. To me, that was just like, yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> you know, be skeptical, but watch out. You, if you don't put your money in the parking meter. So I wanted to bring her alive and back into the conversation. And I guess the sad thing is, is that so much of the of the horror that's going on in the world with refugees and wars and people speaking in cliches, mm -hmm. and, you know, it still exists. But on the other hand, you know, there are brilliant things in her thinking about, like celebrating story and celebrating friendship. So I just wanted to bring that incredibly vital character back in a narrative that would make people kind of engage. But had I attempted to do something that was really political, I don't think it would have done justice to her. Yeah. 
I can see that. I think one of the reasons I, I sort of stumbled upon this book is because I've heard in the last few years a, a number of people saying, you know, we need to return to Hannah Arendt, or we need, we need to think through the contemporary issues that we're facing in the last few years through Hannah Arendt. Like, she's a good source for this. And I think a lot of people have said somewhat similar things like that. And so I don't think it's even really debatable in philosophical circles or intellectual circles that Hannah Arendt is useful and relevant for today's situation. But I'm wondering how you might answer the question of, like, why is she relevant? What makes her relevant today? What, if anything, would you suggest someone reading, maybe reading her for the first time, ought to oh. look for? Why do you think so many people, what is it, are bringing back Hannah Arendt right now? Wow. Yes. I mean, obviously, the whole thing about truth and politics mm -hmm. is so important. The fact that she so understands that he he or she who controls uh, the messaging can control the minds of the, of the masses. And, you know, just these insights into the fact that fake news, you know, as we would call it, she didn't really have that term, mm -hmm. but she defined it so well. It, and, and it's more nuanced than we, so people don't actually, they're a hand, let's just take the flat earthers out there. I mean, there are a handful of people out there who think the world is flat. Yeah. Okay. But, what it does is people don't believe in science and they don't believe in falsity. It, it just, we lose connection to the world with all this foggy, cliched thinking. And I think the rigor of her thinking is refreshing. So I think that's, that's really good. And, you know, she also, uh, to use a cliche, uh, <laughs> sorry, but sometimes, you know, she walked the walk. I mean, she was stateless for 18 years. I mean, what made it very interesting to me was I wanted to do a story about Hannah Rent before she was Hannah Rent, before she was famous. Like she was already doing amazing stuff. And the things that she writes about refugees and, you know, her non, I think her non sentimental attitude toward the world is, is so refreshing. And I think a lot of it is also people have written about it. Um, Deborah Nelson wrote a really good book from the University of Chicago about tough women, non-sentimental women. And, you know, women weren't supposed to be like that. But there was Mary McCarthy and there was, you know, Diane Arbus and there was Susan Sontag. And, of course, Hannah Rent right at the at the top. So I think that female voice um, very just very, very a lot of people say, oh, speak truth to power. But boy, she acted. She acted. I mean, there are things I think, you know, and I I don't want to like. Uh, speculate as to what she would do in the world today. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, if you read about her action-oriented philosophy, you know, doing a Facebook uh, uh, petition would not be her cup of tea. You know, I <laughs> just know that would not be her thing. But the other thing that's kind of amazing about her, and boy, does she get in trouble for this, she made mistakes. And I think this is something that I'm really would like people to, is that we all have to listen to each other in the public space. That means we have to speak clearly and respectfully to one another in the public arena. And a big theme that I was kind of trying to get in the book is that, you know, when people come to us and say, this is the truth, this is what it is, this is how we are, this is who we are, not only does it make people others, but it makes for cliched thinking. She gets criticized because maybe her stuff isn't, you can't implement it. Like, how can you make sure everybody's equal before you have politics? I don't know, work on it. Her thinking is so ahead of its time. In many ways, you know, I do a lot of work in design-oriented problem solving and, and stuff like that and using synthetic thinking to come up with ideas. I think she was a design-oriented thinker. It's solution-oriented thinking. And I think the emphasis on civility in education just a lot. I mean, my God, I could go on mm. and on. You know, as I joke to somebody, getting into Hannah Arendt, and I'm glad that even for people who know her work, it kind of rekindles a fascination and hopefully, you know, will drive people to look at it. But, you know, it's akin to when I first moved to New York City, they had these, uh, I've said this before, but, you know, they had these ads for the Roach Motel. And the headline was, you know, the roaches check in, but they never check out. And you know, with all due respect to the Roaches and to not the band, but <laughs> the and, and Hannah Arendt. And once once you check into Hannah Arendt's thinking, you you never check out. I mean, I'm finding myself five or ten times a day. What would Hannah think? What would Hannah think? Because I think that clarity and rigor 
is something that we need, but it's also got a, got a, a radical kind of empathy. And I think, you know, like I say in the book, the alternative is not very pleasant, mm-hmm. not very good. Definitely. But, and I'll add to that with something that I really believe in, the world is not Disneyland. People want, you know, they think, okay, I'm an adult in this country, blah, blah, blah. Everything should be great. Well, no. Everything should be great and hard, <laughs> you know. I think that's something that we need. Yeah. I think one of the things that you highlight based on her work is the idea that one of the most ethical things that you can do in the world is think critically and carefully through issues rather than simply jumping on bandwagons or not thinking and just kind of uh, going through the world without pausing to question or consider things. And yeah, Hannah Arendt and your, your work of hers right now is a great illustration of that. I'm curious, can you say a little bit maybe about what you're doing next? Uh, yeah, I can. Is it, is it in the vein of uh, Three Escapes or is it quite different? Um, it's a historic, it's historical. Uh, let me just put it to you this way. I am engaging with primary historical material involving some recent discoveries of autobiographies of interwar 1930s, predominantly Jewish teenagers in Eastern Europe, and recently discovered um, autobiographies, part of an ethnography. And I'm engaging with these people, and I'm trying to do it in a way where it's only what they would know at the time. You know, one of the things I talk about what I I did with the, the Hannah Arendt book, and I hopefully will be able to do here, is I'm trying to create a kind of, through comics, which, you know, as Art Spiegelman says, it's a great way of turning time into space. Then Art Spiegelman ought to mm. know, uh, the, the author of Mouse. I'm trying to just bring these moments back to life, almost creating a type, a kind of a time machine without faking it. This is a just an incredible. Uh, I spent uh, more than a month I, in Vilnius, Lithuania, last summer, with you know working with the people at the archives in the state library where these a lot of these documents were found and I'm having them translated and it's it's actually I was just reading I just got a, a translation in last night and it, it's some of the most powerful stuff I've ever encountered and you know the fate of a, many of these people is not known so it's uh, it's huge it's fun it's it's going to be different but challenging like the Hannah Arendt project was kind of an intellectual journey trying to translate her this is highly emotional but like Hannah Rent was too but mm. yeah it's quite a it's quite a thing that sounds good I look forward to seeing it when it comes out me too <laughs> uh, yeah Ken I mean I've taken up a lot of your time and I just want to really thank you for for discussing your work today it's a it's a great book and I recommend it to anybody who's who hasn't picked it up yet well it's been a pleasure talking to you and I I look forward to um, following more of, of your website your podcasts you know I I hope that people are connecting to the thinking of Hannah Arendt. What would I recommend? I mean, you know, it changes from time to time. The profiles that she wrote that were collected in Men in Dark Times, I think, are are really quite wonderful. You know, pretty daring stuff. So, I don't know. There's just so much. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate your thoughts. And uh, like I said, it's a great book that has rekindled my interest and passion for Hannah Arendt, and I'm sure it would for anybody who picks it up. I just have to say thank you for listening and supporting This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Make sure you check out Ken's recommendations for books to read at tinapp.org, and that goes for all of our guests. I should also say that I'm very pleased with my next interview, which is with Larry Grossberg about his book Under the Cover of Chaos. That's coming out in two weeks. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers. Cheers.